here's the thing that you do. And I have a hard time with trifocals now because I'm always moving my head, so my head will move, and I'm hoping when you're painting, your head isn't moving. But you look at the model, and then you take your hand and you're training, and you turn the head, and then you raise the head, and then the eyes can go anywhere until you get to painting the eyes. Then you tell the model, I'm painting your eye now. Hold your eye still right there. That's why <clears throat> normally I would have behind me a television set. Now what you can do is you, you're now using line again. You line up here. And she's just about where I want her. Now, see what you do with the hand here, and this is how you control the head. The head tips here. Now you turn the head. Whoop, too far, come back. <clears throat> and that's about where I'll, she'll be most of the time. Now what I'll do is I'll move in and the first technique that I will use is going to be called wet into wet controlled. And I'm going to come in here and I'm putting water down and the contour drawing that I've already laid in here to save a little time. I'm coming up to that edge Oop, went a little too far, and I'm putting it in just water. Now what you do, and I'm hoping I can convince you to paint this way, I like this method, that you take the color scheme that you're using, and I'm going to use a blue on this, and I'm not going to get into color, not going to get into skin color, and then you put your color into that wet area. And I love to do this with kids, because they see that paint move. Even to the point where if you have some paint left in your brush, why not just take it and do this with it? And then the paint is only going to go where the water is. So I set this up here. I can control it a little bit by coming through here. I try really hard to use the largest brush that I have in my box most of the time. Now the lines are disappearing. And if I want, I set that up. This is indigo, which I really like. Now, I think I'll put a little violet in there. And this is basically what we're going to call an analogous color scheme. An analogous color scheme and the analogous of blue. And it's blue and violet. And if you want to, you can hit a little green. But sometimes my greens are too heavy, and green's pretty hard to, to play with. And it's pretty hard, and you know it's hard because so many people really don't wear green. It's a hard color to use. Then you float the color in. Now what I do is I can take any one of my other brushes because I like to do it a little larger, but I don't think I will. I think what I'll do is just take this, come to here, and I, this can actually be my palette. And I try to keep it really wet. <clears throat> in my system of painting, I use a lot of water, and I pour my colors into that water. And that's going to be my darkest dark. Now I'll take a smaller brush and I'll go anywhere in the painting that I want to go because this is basically my color scheme, my palette right here. I could have brought over here and put a lighter value if I wanted to, but I won't today. Sometimes I do. Now what I'll do is I'll see if I can concentrate on, say, one eye, on one eye. And what I will do is I'll go here, I'll use this paint here, put a little more paint. I'll put a neutral in here. Now this is the one of the only lines in the human face. And it's not really a line, it's a shape. I can actually see her eyelashes here because I am so close. So I have to be careful when I put the eyelashes in. I don't think I will. It gets too corny. And then I will put a lid, just a small lid, right here. Now what I'll do here, I have the two lines that are in the human face. I one of the two, two of the lines. There's a couple more, but not in yours. Now the eyebrow is now floated in. And that's a shape, it's not a line. 1930s, they used to use liners, and they used to have a line for an eyebrow. Now. I just put in another line in the human face. 
That's not really part of the human facing. It's just a line that separates the mouth right here. Now, some people really don't have a line here. Sometimes it's just the edge of the lip. Catherine has a line. And the light on her right now is, is somewhat flat, but that upper lip is the darker than the bottom lip. And so you put that in, there's one value, and it is one value. And it's a shape. Don't put a line around the lip. There's not a line around the lip. And I find so many amateur painters, they draw a line around the lip. There's not a line around the lip. There's a line around the lip if you're doing a contour drawing. But the line that you see is right here, between the mouth. Now, her mouth from this position is a little bit down, going this way. Out of the bottom lip here, and we start working a shadow. See, now what we're doing is just floating the value here down the head. Here's another really beautiful shape that my model has, which is this little shape right in here. And the light on her not isn't really doesn't accentuate that mark very much. All right, now I'm going to move this a little bit here to the right, and I want to give you a little quick view of a close-up of an eye. This little tiny eye right here is basically, I put actually put the eyelashes in, and I could have killed myself. And, uh, but I did. Then what you think about when you have the eye is you think about that light underneath. One of the things you have to be really be careful at when you're painting that eye is not to put a line above the eye and then put a line below the eye. Because if you put the line above and the line below, it closes the eye. And I, whenever once in a while I see gals wearing so much makeup under, I say, gee, that to me, as an artist, that closes the eye. I like to think if I want to flatter this person, I can put a mark here on the end of that eye, which pulls the eye further apart because stereotyped eyes are wide set. That's only a stereotype. Here's a light into that eye, right there. Now what I go do here is come back to this painting, as we played around with that, and we come back to this eye here, and we try to do the same thing. Now I'm using a little different style, a lot more water, than I'm working with here. But here's the value and the value with this light is, is just driving me crazy. There is a value that goes into that eye. So many times people, when they paint the eye, and my teachers used to say this to me, is that my eye looked like gingerbread boys, like this because they were so linear, you know, with little beady eyes like that. And this was all white. There really isn't white in the eye. It's only psychological. There's shadow now in the eye. Now, on the outside of that eye is a little tiny, wish I knew what that was called, that part of the eye. Then the pupil, and then the light comes out of that eye. It's broken up as it goes to here, and then it sets up to here, and then moves to here. Now what I'm doing here is really drawing with the paint, really drawing with the paint. And sometimes I'll set this up and I'll draw with the paint and then all of a sudden I'll come in, change my brushes, and set this socket up here with this big brush. So here's the edge of the head right here. And I think what I'll do is put a value and set this thing off right here with the shoulder. And I'll do it just like this but a different value. So here we go, all that value. If I was really working on this, and I was going to work on it for a long time, it wasn't just an exercise, I would break these up and I would utilize the space. I would utilize the space behind her. You know, I'd squint my eyes and say, okay, got this shape, got that shape, got the shape, dark and light. But never, never, never with a line. I always try to do it with a shape. Here's all my water. 
to speed things up, you can take a big brush, and then you got all the water, and then you're going to do the same thing you did here by taking the color and dropping it in. Boy, wasn't that bright. Then we'll come in here and we'll put the black behind her, right to there. Then this is all the water and all the edges, things that I want. And this is where the texture comes for me. Otherwise, I don't use it. And lots of times, just say, if I put that blue there and I don't have it somewhere else, I will put it somewhere just by reaching over into the painting and hitting it. And then, if I want it to be a little freer, I just take water and I just drop water into that area. And all I'm concentrating on, boys and girls, value, value, value. A little tiny bit of shape, but I'm trying to pull it all together. And with this particular painting right here, I'm not really worried about it looking just like her. All I'm thinking about is, well, okay, just a demonstration of technique. This is a line that I put in right here. And that's too strong, and so now I have to take and put a value next to that line so I don't see it anymore. Now you can also drop that blue down, meaning you can change it so it isn't as bright, with a neutral. A neutral being here, which would be Indian red or something like that. Then it won't be quite as bright. Then you just float it. And then we'll put the value here with the hair. It's so funny that people, when you're painting them, they, one of the first things they say is, well, my nose is too big or somewhere like that. The nose is so uh, minor in a painting. And the only way the nose really will come off too strong is if you come from the light side and put the dark over here. But here, you're just putting in paint, and you're concentrating on this being a painting rather than a portrait you're going to send home to mother. Now I'll come down, pick up the neck here. One of the things now, if you're going to have the model pose, you want the model uh, in a collared shirt, such as she's wearing, or a t-shirt, but you want the neck to show. If she were in a turtleneck, the painting would look like the head is being served up on a, on a pallet sort of like John the Baptist. Okay, now here's a value here that really will have to come together with the other, with the other part of the painting because it's now a spot. So I hit that, and I hit it with the same blue, and I'll just go from here. So now the values can come together. Now I'll come back to her. I like to always kind of put a light into the eye on this side, even though this is going to be my darkest side. And one of the things that I would like to think you wouldn't worry about are ears. Don't worry about an ear. I don't think anyone's ears are that great that you have to draw them. So see, the ear is out here somewhere. And her ears do show in reality. But this isn't reality. This is an abstract kind of venture of her, which becomes paint on paper. See, when I look at that, that's a little too dark. So I can either lighten this or I just make that darker. I'll come up and introduce this right here. And I like to always take my colors and put them elsewhere in the painting and then, and then move them into the painting. If I put this color right in here, I'll have a better socket anyway. down to here. Go pick that bag up again. That was kind of a bad move right there. This is a little strong here, so I'm going to have to make that really strong. Come in now with an Indian red. Decided I wasn't going to make it. I was going to go over and pick up a color next to it.
back down to here, over to here. Play with it a little bit. Down to here. Now I might as well put the neck in. Funny thing about the neck, and I always notice that in photography. Uh, See, so you squint your eyes. You squint your eyes and you look and say, okay, is the neck darker than the chin? Well, it really is. But seldom do I do that. I usually make the neck lighter and make the chin darker, and then automatically then the chin becomes stronger. I get play with this a lot. Now that you have acquired some of the ability to draw and paint faces, look at some of Kirk's portraits. Look at the presence of light and dark, but mainly of light, and look at the balance and composition of shapes. Note that there are hardly any lines at all to disturb the poetry and rhythm of his paintings. In the next tape, Kirk will show you much more of his secrets of how to obtain that airiness, that flow and that harmony, so that you too can express what you see in a face, and more importantly, behind it. The watercolor medium is ideally suited for that.